Hi, listeners. This is Chris Batts, your host of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Today's episode I'm excited to share is about my conversation with a highly visible global M&A law partner in New York at an AmLaw 10 firm. Today, we talked about large corporate M&A and global markets as it relates to the political climate of the U.S. and other countries and economies. I also asked him about his advice for aspiring or seasoned M&A partners. Just a reminder, the PDF transcript of this audio is available to download. Go to LangroupRecruiting.com forward slash podcast. As many of you know, we interview corporate defense, law firm leaders, partners, general counsels, and legal consultants. You are listening to episode number 20 of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. Broadcasting from Kansas City, this is the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. In each episode, you'll receive actionable ideas and hear personal leadership stories of the top corporate defense law firms from around the United States. Enjoy a front row seat with law firm leaders, their partners, and legal consultants as we discuss life and leadership. Welcome to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Batts with The Lion Group. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Frank Aquila, law partner of Solomon Cromwell. Frank is consistently recognized in the global M&A world. He is known for his Chambers Global Band One recognition as the American Lawyer Dealmaker of the Year and the Atlas Award Global M&A Lawyer of the Year. Representative and clients include, but are not limited to, Amgen, Anheuser-Busch, InBev, Diageo, Chenier Energy, Kraft, AIG, and again, just to name a few. He currently is the member of Sullivan and Cromwell's Management Committee. Frank received his JD from Brooklyn Law School and undergrad from Columbia. Welcome, Frank, to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Good to be here, Chris. Frank, I know you have a busy schedule, and I'm sure things are quite interesting watching the current political climate in the U.S. and then also around the world. I I wanted to just jump right in and ask you your impressions of what you anticipate M&A-wise because of the tax code revisions, the lower rates, repatriation, that sort of thing. What are you anticipating? First of all, I'm I'm anticipating a very busy year. January was the busiest uh, January for the M&A market in uh, at least a decade, probably longer. And uh, it's really being fueled uh, by and large by uh, the tax cuts, at least here in the U.S. That's excellent. Is there any specific sectors that are you're seeing more activity in? Well, I think one of the things about any big consolidation boom, any big period of M&A is that you know, it's across sectors and across geographies. And I think that's what you're seeing so far. And that's what we'll continue to see. Obviously, consumer and retail are, are hot, but I think yeah. we're going to see it in financial institutions. Yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of tech and media, but it's going to be across the board. I'm sure you've been, you watched a little bit of Davos and maybe you're agnostic, but I'm curious what your impressions are, you know, post Davos, post like Trump's trade war comments uh, with China and kind of what's going on globally. How do you think that's going to affect M&A? Well, I think, you know, clearly if you look at 2015, 2016, 2017, things were moving definitely towards uh, populism anti-global trade. I think everybody's recognizing that uh, you can't get rid of NAFTA, you can't get rid of global trade. And uh, we're starting to see the swing back towards uh, global trade and global integration. Just the phrase, it's not America alone, signals that we're not in 2017 anymore. So I think we're going to see a lot more cross-border M&A. Are you? Okay. I've been really starting to watch and listen on the president in China with regards to China's tech companies wanting to come to the U.S. markets. Do you anticipate this administration kind of cracking down on antitrust, not antitrust, but maybe it is antitrust, but matters of security or I'm curious your impressions of China wanting to come in the U.S. and even find different ways of getting in here? CFIUS, uh, which is essentially uh, the national security uh, regulation for acquisitions in the United States, or even of non-U.S. companies that uh, have significant interests in the United States, have not allowed that many Chinese uh, acquirers over time. Certainly in the tech sector, it's, it's difficult. Uh, I think we will not see a lot of 
uh, Chinese uh, acquirers in the tech sector. But in other sectors, uh, I don't see any reason why we uh, shouldn't see deals. And I expect to see deals in other sectors. And, and tell me about those other ones. Are you thinking more like the EU um, with Brexit and what's happening in the strengthening euro? Well, uh, I'm talking first about the United States. I okay. can see, you know, certainly in uh, consumer and retail right. uh, deals in those sectors being approved. And, and of course, uh, deals in the EU as well, where Asian companies, Chinese, Japanese and otherwise, wanting to uh, have a position both in the UK, which will be a large independent economy, and in the rest of the EU as well. With Brexit continuing to kind of unfold before us, what are you anticipating between an agreement, say, between the UK and the EU? I don't know if you saw the article about comparing uh, the UK with Norway or with Canada and kind of the different approaches. But I'm curious what kind of result is going to UK is going to end up with, I guess. Well, you know, it, it's hard to speculate on that, given the fact that the deal still has not yet been cut. Clearly, it's going to have an economy that will be integrated in some way with the rest of Europe. Just it naturally has to be because it's a big trading partner with the rest of Europe. And so both sides will uh, want to assure that. Having said that, the UK will uh, uh, have some trading partners that are going to be different than the rest of the uh, EU. Uh, net net, it's probably Brexit's probably negative for the UK, okay. but uh, at some point uh, we'll we'll see where it comes out. I'd love your take, since we're taking a really high-level perspective on the global markets, with Macron you know, taking the reins in France, I'd love to get your opinions on how their kind of economic engine starting to rev up and what you anticipate seeing there. Well, I think you know, for a long time, France was a real drag on the European economy. And in fact, now uh, France is in growth. And so as a consequence, we're seeing uh, growth in uh, the uh, Eurozone generally. Uh, certainly, we're seeing strong growth out of uh, Germany. And so hopefully, the positive policies there will be much, much more positive than the uh, populist uh, agendas of uh, you know, some of the other politicians in uh, Europe. Right. Populist being they want to leave the EU or be more restrictive on immigration. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And probably also protective with their labor laws. It seems to me that's the big contention there too. Yeah, that's a very big uh, part of it. Yeah. I'd love to get your impressions on the rumors that tend to kind of float around when you look at a company like Amazon. I mean, other big emerging companies in the U.S. as it relates to, or even Google, I should say, Facebook, as it relates to just government involvement in antitrust issues. I mean, are you going to see a, another situation like a baby bell happening through, through these big companies and kind of really taking up the market? I, I, I certainly hope not. Uh, I think that uh, it's one thing when you had the old at and I'm not talking about the current at and but the old at and had such a monopoly and the way it grew up it really stifled uh, growth in telecommunications at a point in time where telecommunications was exploding. The fact of the matter is, in the tech sector, in the internet sector, there is so much innovation. You do not need to break these companies up or overly regulate these companies in order to, uh, in any way, shape, or form, have the innovation that we need. We certainly have the innovation that we need. They're competing with each other. They're competing with legacy businesses. So I don't see any reason to have to break them up. Yeah, that's excellent. I hope uh, <laughs> I hope the administration believes the same. I'm in agreement with you. <laughs> if they're rational, they will. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can't guarantee that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. I, I know we're getting very kind of economic or even, yeah, politics and all this, but it, it does affect the global economy. I, I, I'd love to just get your thoughts on the unique effect that even the Fed is having to pay attention to, which is the desire for inflation, but yet, again, going to back Amazon and these different companies that are keeping 
potentially the price of goods down because of competition. Do you have any, I don't know, predictions as to how long this would continue and are we going to actually see inflation? Well, you know, the uh, real uh, issue is we're talking about the tax cut at the uh, beginning here. And if this is additional Keynesian stimulus, and I don't mean to get too wonky, then you would presumably have inflation. On the other side, if this uh, infusion of capital leads to more innovation and greater production, then you're going to see greater competition, and and that will actually uh, tamp down inflation. So I hope that the Fed is cautious in not raising rates until we actually see inflation, because so far we haven't. Now, we may, with labor shortages, skilled labor shortages in the next couple of years, actually see that inflation, but it's not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it was Yellen yesterday, uh, Janet Yellen stepped down and they all kind of unanimously voted not to raise rates. So it will be uh, fascinating to watch. uh, And I just want to say something about Janet Yellen, because I think it is timely. Uh, She really, truly did an absolute outstanding job as uh, chair of the Federal Reserve for the last uh, four years. And I think it was in a transition period after Bernanke, after the uh, crisis. financial crisis. Yeah. And so I think she deserves a, a tremendous amount of credit. She did a fabulous job. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Just the ability to be very scrupulous in how quickly or how slow to raise those rates without overheating the economy. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very tough position to be in, I would assume. Truly masterful. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think her successor is going to follow the same line of thought and expertise? I I think so. I would certainly hope so. Whatever you think about our government under either administration, Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Fed, uh, whether it's under Bernanke, under Yellen, uh, has truly served us well over very difficult uh, Mm -hmm. financial periods over the last uh, decade. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to agree with you, too. I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about your role in M&A, rather influential. You've, you've been involved in some very large, significant deals. If I'm not correct, I mean, it was the the Kraft deal. Is it Heinz Kraft? I represented Kraft in the uh, combination with Heinz. That's correct. Yeah. And then also the rather, I don't know if it's called aggressive, but the InBev Anheuser-Busch deal, you're involved in that one as well, correct? Well, it, it was unsolicited. Uh, you know, some called it hostile at the time. Right. Right. And then You've been a part of, I mean, these are beverage and food related, but then, you know, the company that then now has morphed into what used to be Guinness. I mean, they've rebranded. Do I understand that correctly? Well, it's now Diageo. Diageo. The old Guinness and Grand Met became Diageo, right? Yeah. Yeah. With watching these massive behemoths evolve and do you, I I guess we're, we're anticipating similar deals like that this year. I mean, those are monstrous deals that changed the, the global landscape with some branding. We're, we're anticipating the same this year. I, I mean, we, we saw, I mean, it's always the question of is Kroger going to get bought up and other very large name brand companies. I'm, I'm assuming you're assuming the same. I am assuming the same. And I think what I would also say is that sometimes the biggest transactions are not the most important ones. <laughs> Often they are, but let me give you a uh, an example. Uh, one of the most important transactions of 2017 was Amazon.com's acquisition of Whole Foods. Yeah. Certainly not the biggest deal of the year. Uh, I don't even know it was the biggest deal of the month, but it was disruptive and it changed a number of sectors. And I think what we're going to see is that as technology changes, as technology seeks more outlets into legacy businesses, that we're going to see more and more of these disruptive deals. Some of them will be huge. Some of them will be much smaller. But those are going to be the ones that have the long-term impact. Yeah. What's your what's your take on the most recent announcement of, you know, JP Morgan, Amazon and Berkshire coming together in the healthcare industry? 
Well, you know, that's an interesting announcement. I think we have to wait and see what they actually yeah. do. And that's a powerhouse between the three of them. But we have to wait and see what comes of it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard not to speculate that it's going to not... I mean, it sounds like it's going to be disruptive. And it sounds like... I mean, with the press release, they talked about, oh, this is not a for-profit initiative. But it's hard to believe that that won't eventually become so. Disrupting the rest of these other, you know, public healthcare companies. Again, a press release is easy to write. Actually putting it into action is uh, much more difficult. I think when you look at the three players involved, they've all been uh, outstanding at generating shareholder return. And uh, will they uh, have the same level of impact uh, for something like this? So I think, again, it remains to be seen what actually happens there. Yeah. It's going to certainly be interesting to watch. Yeah, uh, very interesting to watch. So you've done a number of large deals, noteworthy deals. Would you mind sharing briefly maybe one of them that was the most noteworthy or maybe the most interesting or fun? What, what would stand out to you as something as you'd tell your, your kids and your colleagues and your grandkids, that sort of thing? There's so many because I've been doing this for so yeah. long. Yeah. Uh, I do think that one of the most interesting was one that you mentioned earlier was uh, InBev's uh, acquisition of uh, Anheuser-Busch. We started off, it was completely unsolicited. It was in an election year. Most of the analysts said that uh, we would never be able to take over uh, Anheuser-Busch. It was an American icon. And uh, people predicted that if we were successful, it would take us uh, a year to uh, get it done and a lot more money. And 34 days after we uh, launched uh, our bid, we signed an agreement to get it done. (laughs) And then even after that, there was the Lehman crash and suddenly... You couldn't finance a car loan for a period of time, and uh, we were able to uh, pull together and keep together $55 billion worth of financing and close at the beginning of November of uh, 2008, uh, which, as I say, was a really difficult time for uh, the credit markets globally. So it, it was an exciting deal from beginning to end. Yeah, and sounds rather miraculous. It seemed like we needed a miracle every single day, and somehow we seemed to get one in some days, too. <laughs> That's excellent. It was my desire to um, ask you, you know, because you've been doing this for so long, what advice would you give um, either seasoned or aspiring M&A attorneys, either delivery of service or looking at deals? Yeah, What, what advice would you give from, from your perspective in your role? Always. Try to understand the objectives of your client. And you may say, well, don't you know your client wants you to, wants to buy that company or your client wants to sell their company? But typically, there are bigger, more strategic issues that your client is looking for. And you want to understand that. And you also want to understand what are the motivations on the other side, because When you understand where your client is coming from and when you understand where the other side is coming from, you then have a different picture when you're sitting at the negotiating table. And at the end, it may come down to dollars per share, but a lot of the issues along the way, it really helps you to work through the deal and get it to that final stage. And all too often... Lawyers and sometimes bankers have too narrow a focus instead of on the big picture. Yeah, so forest for the trees. That's a good way to put it. Here's another question, and I appreciate you sharing that. What is your impression or take on, you know, the ongoing activist investor movement? You know, it's repackaged from the 1980s into now the White Knights and the uh, Carl icons right now. I mean, do you see them as helpful? Do you work with them? Have you have you come across Carl or other activists that have very well known out there and their involvement in what's happening? Kind of more or less their impression of policing the uh, the publicly traded companies in the United States. 
Well, I think you have to step back and understand, first of all, that corporate governance in America has changed fundamentally. And part of the reason it's changed is you go to the 1950s, 5% of publicly traded shares were held by institutional investors. Today, 5% of the shares are held by individuals and 95% are held by institutions. So uh, the institutional investor is much more powerful. It, it, It changes the whole relationship with the board and management. And not all activist shareholders not all hedge funds, not all institutional shareholders are the same. In some cases, many of the so-called activists are some of the long-term shareholders. They're not trading in and out of the stock every day. So I tell boards, don't think that every single uh, activist is the same. Be open to their ideas. Talk with them. Talk to all your institutional shareholders. Engagement with your shareholders is a good thing, particularly when they are sophisticated institutions. That doesn't mean that you do everything they say. That doesn't mean that uh, everything they tell you is necessarily going to be good because they're working on public information. You know a lot more about your business. But engagement, listening to their ideas, that's never a bad thing. Yeah, very good. Frank, kind of just taking a shift into more what I like to do with each interview is kind of just having my uh, listeners learn a little bit more about you personally. So fill me in a little bit about what you do, say, outside of the practice of law that you're passionate about right now. Well, uh, a big thing uh, for me, and it's always been because I've been married for uh, uh, over 30 years, is my wife, Kathy, and our three daughters who are now grown. And uh, my oldest daughter is married and uh, my two other daughters, one's a a teacher, another one's a law student. And they, growing up and now as adults, have always uh, been a big part of our lives. And they continue to be uh, a, a central part of our uh, lives. And that's a lot of what I do when I'm not at the office or not on conference calls. Yeah, I understand that. And are, are you guys New Jersey, Manhattan, Connecticut? Uh, live in uh, Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was born on uh, uh, the island and uh, uh, haven't gotten very far over the years. <laughs> did, did you meet your wife on the island? Uh, yeah, actually in, in Brooklyn, but, uh, not, not too far. Okay. Yeah, definitely not <laughs> All far. in the city of New York. Okay. Very good. And so no, no grandkids yet. No, none yet. None yet. Okay. I, I'm sure your, your wife is pleading. I would say, I would say soon, but I don't want to put any pressure on anybody. Oh, that's good. D- does your wife put the pressure? Cause. Nope, 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 no. Nope. We're not that kind. Okay. Good for you. <laughs> Uh, you also had mentioned to me at one point that wine and New York sports teams and restaurants and travel were important to you. Yes, I've uh, I've been a uh, wine lover for a long, long time, and have a lot of uh, old wines that, luckily, uh, some of the wines I bought 20 years ago are starting to really uh, peak and come of age, and continue to buy some of the best wines in the world, and. So I love that. The New York restaurant scene is obviously uh, great. Uh, I think one of the great things about rooting for the Mets and the Jets and the Knicks and the Rangers, those are my my teams, is you build a lot of character because you know how to uh, deal with loss and uh, root for the Mets and Jets uh, even though they struggle. And I think it uh, builds a lot of uh, character uh, rooting for those teams. <laughs> I, it reminds me of the folks that root for the Cubs. I mean, it's just tremendous, <laughs> tremendous character. <laughs> well, I'm not going to talk about the Cubs. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> As I said, I'm a Mets fan. Yes, I, I am sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any uh, choice uh, restaurants in town that you enjoy frequenting? Uh, I think one great new restaurant that is just over the top, it's in Greenwich Village. It's an Italian restaurant called Don Angie, A-N-G-I, and it's just absolutely uh, uh, phenomenal. Uh, Husband and wife uh, team are the chef owners, and they've been, they're behind a number of great restaurants in the city, and this is their first independent effort, and uh, they just really are terrific, and if you like Italian food and 
you're in Manhattan. That's the place to go. Excellent. I'll definitely note that. It, tell me about travels. Do you and your wife have a favorite place you like to frequent or are you more adventurers finding new places? Uh, adventurous. We've been to all seven continents, uh, yeah. Antarctica, Galapagos, oh, wow. uh, B- Bhutan. Yeah, we really have been all over. And then our daughters, uh, we've infected them with the travel bug as well. That's excellent. So we really have been all over the place. Yeah, it's um, something that my wife and I greatly love too. You just got to go. I'm sure you've been to New Zealand then. I've actually, that's one of the places on our list. We've been to uh, Australia, we've been to Tasmania, we've been to Fiji, so sort of circle uh, around New Zealand, but uh, that's a place I think you really need a, a couple of weeks to go down there and, and really explore both islands. Yeah, yeah, I have to so agree with you. something we want to do. It's fun. It, uh, you had mentioned earlier, too, that you were a history major at Columbia, um, and I wanted to ask you recommended or current readings of history books or biographies. What, what are you reading right now? What do you recommend for my listeners? Clearly, the book of 2017 was a grant by Chernow, yeah. and uh, as uh, I think many people know, uh, uh, Chernow's previous book was Hamilton, and uh, that morphed into Hamilton, uh, an American musical by Lynn Emanuel uh, Miranda. So, uh, is, is, first of all, Grant was just a phenomenal book. But I just wondered how in the world Lynn Emanuel was going to turn this into a, a musical. But uh, I, I suspect it's not going to wind up being a musical, but it's a great book. Yeah, for, for Grant, yeah, that would be interesting. But if anybody can pull it off, Lynn Emanuel can do it. I believe it. Yeah, Hamilton has just unrivaled success. It's, it's so fun. Yeah, and I was very lucky. Uh, we, we actually uh, were able to see it uh, first at the Public Theater downtown and then, of course, uh, later on Broadway. And seeing it first at the Public Theater before anybody really knew about it was really a very rare treat. I would say so. Were they actually there very long or were they only do one performance? Or No, no, no. This was probably, I want to say, about they were there about six months. Six months. Okay. And then they went yeah. to Broadway. Wow. Right. Well, I, I kind of wanted to bring it to a close and, and, and bring a final question. Do you have any mentors or people who are heroes for you that come to your mind as you're in this position uh, at a firm like Solomon Cronwell, the, one of the top M&A firms in the world, just reflecting uh, from a place of like gratefulness, like who, who's influenced you to get you to this place? Well, certainly many of the partners here who came before me who were partners when I was a young associate, I owe a lot to. I think two in particular, uh, one, uh, Ben Stapleton, who was the longtime head of the M&A practice here and is now a retired partner. The other is our uh, uh, senior chairman uh, and former chairman of the firm, uh, Raj Cohen, uh, who you know is a legend in yeah. the uh, legal profession. Uh, both of them I work with quite a bit during my associate career and were just terrific mentors uh, to me and continue to be terrific mentors. That's amazing. And it, what a rarity just to be among those men and for now you to uh, kind of step in their shoes in some regard. It's amazing. Uh, a, a, a true a true professional and personal privilege. Yeah. yeah Frank, um, you know, it, Honestly, I know you're very busy. It's been an honor and truly a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for your time today. It's been great speaking with you. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, who listened to this episode of the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or would like to recommend someone to be on the podcast, please email them to podcast at findthelions.com. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes. Also, please share our podcast by email or social media. To share a podcast, listen to more shows, or read the transcript of this audio, go to liongrouprecruiting.com forward slash podcast. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Leadership Podcast. This podcast is for education purposes only. This content cannot be used for commercial use without written permission from the Lion Group. If you like this podcast, leave a review on iTunes.